Good morning again to everyone. So in this morning session, we are going to be focusing on strengthening the One Health approach to AMR surveillance. So we know that if we if we are if we want to be able to tackle AMR, then our surveillance. Pour tackler la RAM, nous avons besoin d'avoir des stratégies et nos approches. Have a One Health focus which means putting similar importance to surveillance in the animal health sector as we do with the human health sector. So as we discuss this, the stereo, this morning's presentation is going to be given by Institute Pasteur Dakar and Dr. Sheikh Fal, who I'll introduce um, in a minute. But really what we want to be able to explore are what are the issues that we face in the animal health and the human health sector in terms of AMR? What are some of the resistance strains that we're seeing and what is the potential for crossover? I think in our previous sections, we have discussed the fact that a lot of the new and emerging um, diseases that we see and where we are seeing the pandemics occurring in our recent, um, our recent history, if we look at the coronavirus, if we look at monkeypox, which has just come up, if we look at other diseases of priority, uh, which, which have emerged over the last 10 years, a lot of those have come from zoonotic origins. And so for having a One Health approach to our surveillance strategies cannot be underestimated. And not only that, but to be able to have studies which look at the similarities of the resistance strains that we're seeing in animals and in humans and the potentials then for crossover from the animal to the human chain is going to be very important. Those of you who are familiar with um, the Africa Pathogen Genomics Initiative will know that there is a huge emphasis that is being put onto genomics as a strategy to surveillance, to really look at the genomics of all these strains of different pathogens for us to be able to understand and to learn more from them and to look at how we can go out here about tackling um, these um, emerging uh, pathogens. And so this morning, we are very happy to have a presentation from Institute Pasteur Dakar on studies that they have done to look at salmonella strains, resistant salmonella strains in animals and humans, and to ask the question then, what is the potential for crossover that we see from these strains? Our presentation this morning is going to be given by Dr. Sheikh Fal. So let me, let me give you a little brief biography of Dr. Fal. So Dr. Fall is a scientist at the Institute Pasteur de Dakar, whose missions are research, education, and training public health biotechnology through the development of vaccines and diagnostic tools. In his role, Dr. Fall contributes to sciences, vulgarization, and the mentorship of young talents at the Institute Pasteur de Dakar. Dr. Fowle joined the poll of microbiology, has joined the Department of Microbiology since 2020 after a postdoc on virology. Its research activities, his research activities are focused on diagnostic um, mi micro, uh, microbial studies and AMR surveillance through a One Health approach. Dr. Fall has also trained in molecular biology and genetics and has a solid background on bacteriology and virology. So really, if you look at that biography and that background, there's no better person to give this presentation. And to, to start this conversation about what we are seeing in the human health, in the animal health sector in terms of AMS resistance strains and um, what the potential risk may be for the cross um, transmission of some of these strains to the human health, um, to the human chain. So um, without much further ado, I would like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Fowl. So Dr. Fowl, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to do this presentation. Uh, and and uh, it is a, a great honor for me to, to do it. So for this presentation, I think I will do it in friendship because I think some, part, some parts can uh, from French country, and also I'm more comfortable in, in, in to speak in French. Uh, merci, merci Beatrice. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, uh, for uh, 
this opportunity given to me to uh, give you this uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to uh, speak about the AMR profiling of Salmonella in humans and chicken in Senegal. Thank you very much. I am excited to do this uh, presentation and it is an honor uh, for me to talk about uh, this uh, subject of uh, acu actuality uh, regarding uh, the One Health approach and uh, surveillance and uh, regarding the uh, problem uh, and uh, this problem and the model that we saw was uh, a comparative uh, study uh, regarding isola of salmonella in humans in senegal next slide please regarding the background salmonella uh, represents a major common uh, problem for health in humans as it is implied in uh, most uh, contamination of uh, uh, food contaminations for humans and uh, this is why this uh, represents a major impact as we can find it very often in a uh, food uh, produced and also um, commercial products, animal products. And they are, uh, we have uh, 2,600 uh, serovars identified so far, which is uh, quite important according to us. And Salmonella trans is transmitted uh, really along the farm to fork continuum. And we see that some serovars are uh, really uh, host restricted, whereas other have broad host spectrum known as host adapted serovars. Regarding uh, the clinical uh, aspect, Salmonella infections are uh, characterized. Uh, a, as we can see, many cases of gastroenteritis not fatal and are caused by several serovars. And you also have invasive diseases such as typhoid fevers, which uh, implies mainly serovar stiffy and paratifi. And you also have some cases which we observed more and more, uh, invasive uh, non-typhoidal salmonema, which we commonly call INTS. Next slide, please. Regarding typhoid fever and INTS, these are estimated to cause over 25 million cases. And uh, you also, uh, we also find nearly uh, 900,000 deaths annually caused by a typhoid fever or infections INTS. Data on a typhoid fever and INTS are as scarce in Africa. We can also even see sporadic cases uh, that have been reported in Africa available. Data indicate that uh, INTS is a significant cause of uh, invasive disease in uh, SSA uh, uh, with uh, tifimurium and enteroiditis being the most frequently isolated serovars regarding uh, the sub-Saharan Africa's region. And uh, the uh, challenges in the reduction of uh, salmonella treatment. Um, as I said, as I said, stiffimurium and enteritis uh, are the most frequent, frequently isolated serovars. Regarding their uh, scarcity, we can also uh, 
we have treatment option and uh, but tre treatment option is the challenge regarding uh, reduction of salmonellis and the increasing AMR clone as there is a strong increase of uh, infection in the sub-Saharan uh, region linked to non-controlled uh, uh, usage of uh, antibiotics and uh, certainly for E. coli where we use abusively anti antibiotics for this uh, treatment. So uh, therefore a resistance uh, clone or clone presenting a resistance. If we uh, now look at the last uh, publication of uh, WHO, we can estimate that there will be a 700,000 case of uh, fatalities uh, uh, caused uh, by uh, this, but also um, since uh, we can estimate also that the uh, impact uh, and the fatalities will increase. And uh, regarding what was uh, also uh, published uh, in the Lancet uh, uh, journal in 2022, the estimation was revised and uh, we uh, would estimate now that there are uh, millions of, uh, I would say 4.5 millions of fatalities uh, and Africa has the highest burden regarding these uh, infection cases. So uh, my apologies. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, please come back to, uh, for, the, for the objective. Can we please come back to the objective slides? So the aim of uh, this uh, study was to determine the resistance uh, profile of non-typhoidal salmonella strains from uh, clinical salmonellosis cases in humans and the potential transmission of these uh, strains from little chicken meat. So we wanted to do a benchmark uh, studies regarding the transmission between the two sector, human health and uh, animal health. And we were able to do a serotyping, but also to study the uh, relation uh, regarding the phylogenic relation, the resistance that are normally, as we can see, uh, are related. Next uh, slide, please. The methodology adopted, um, it was a retrospective uh, study at uh, the IPD uh, since 2012. We worked on, between 2012, July and June 2013. So we between Sampling was done in Dakar through a survey conducted between this period. And uh, we worked mainly in the region of uh, Dakar. So salmonella strain were collected from chicken carcasses, sold, sold uh, and uh, multi-purposed uh, market. And also at the level of laboratory, we did uh, some uh, culture regarding uh, diarrhea stools patients visiting IPD to isolate uh, salmonella. So culture was done using RVE medium for enrichment and isolation with uh, XLD and uh, hecton media for isolation. Isolate strains were confirmed using API 20E and AST realized based on CASFM according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendation. So once uh, this work was 
uh, done. We've done this classical or traditional uh, serotyping that was performed by a uh, slide agglutination in a Kaufman white scheme according to what was recommended. Next slide, please. In total, we uh, compared the 72 salmonella isolate recovered from a human, so namely uh, 19 uh, cases uh, and uh, 53 uh, in chicken meat, as we can see here, including different serotypes that were selected uh, that were selected for genomic study. And uh, for the genomic study, we uh, did uh, a complete uh, sequencing sequencing of the genome, uh, genomic DNA extraction used using the master pure DNA kit and DNA libraries prepared with the Nextera XTDNA library uh, kit. And we've done the sequencing, uh, uh, which was uh, performed using um, MySec, which is the Illumina uh, platform. Uh, regarding the QC on generated data, followed uh, we followed the de novo <coughs> assembling uh, with uh, Chauville uh, V1.1.0 using uh, Spadus uh, V314.1, and then plasmid detection was done with plasmid Spadus a genome assembler V3.1.4.1, and then resistance and virulence genes were investigated using online platforms such as card RestFinder, and that are really adapted to a research uh, and um, i we also used uh, abricard and vfdb uh, and all these uh, plus platform are accessible online you can find them serotyping was uh, determinated uh, using uh, sex zero two and uh, Sequence type, uh, I mean, a profile with uh, MLST uh, database was used to do that. And uh, through Oxford, we call it MLST. Once all of this was done, we started to look uh, at uh, the uh, phylogeny and it was done based on the N uh, SNPs uh, from the core genome with uh, CSI phylogeny, as you see here. Next slide, please. The results obtained uh, showed a, quite a great diversity regarding the serotypes distribution. We have 24 serotypes identified, mainly Brancaster, 14, uh, and then Kentucky, 13, Hadar, uh, 11, Chester, 4, uh, Schwarz and Grund, 4, and uh, Seftenberg, if uh, 4. If you, uh, there are serotypes that are really specific. Some of them are specific to humans, while others are more uh, specific to animals. And that, uh, you have in blue the one uh, found in humans and in blue in animals. And um, they are certain serotypes uh, found uh, which explain the transmissions between the two. And um, despite this great diversity, certain serotypes such as banana and gaminara are found in one person in period, different periods, which uh, really, uh, I would say, um, indicate a possible silent outbreak. Next slide, please. Regarding the, when we try to do the uh, representation, look at the reportation for the phylogenic diversity, we can see that serotypes are clustered uh, uh, or samples are clustered according to serotypes uh, accepted for Kentucky belonging to SDs 9118 uh, uh, 
198 and uh, 314, and you have Kentucky ST 198, uh, which is an emerging clone harboring genomic island with uh, MRD determinants. Uh, and you can see the 314 are in comment and 198 as well. Um, and otherwise, other serotypes are clustered together, as you can see here. The particularity of uh, Kentucky ST198 is an emerging uh, uh, clone that uh, really uh, was uh, diffused. Uh, so it could definitely uh, host resistance. Uh, and otherwise, we also saw that uh, serotypes uh, Kentucky together with the Schwartz and Grand ST90S are both found in a human and a chicken sources. And otherwise, uh, other serotypes uh, are more specific uh, as uh, mentioned. Next slide, please. If we do an analysis now regarding the particularities uh, observed in human isolates, we can see on salmonella isolates, we have a resistance uh, on a first and second line salmonella uh, molecules. And uh, I would say salmonella treatments was rare, except uh, to SXT 30,9%, uh, 40% uh, uh, almost uh, with salmonella. In contrast, it was uh, high to uh, quinolone, 19.4% uh, uh, regarding uh, macrolide, 30.6% uh, and cycline. 48.6%. Uh, uh, and uh, we used uh, quinolone to uh, treat uh, salmonella regarding the isolate obtained, uh, as otherwise there was a resistance to salmonella. Uh, I believe someone has a mic open. open. Can you please switch off your mic, Raymond? And then MDR was found on 27.8%, uh, uh, 20 on 72. I believe that isolate including um, uh, respecting MDR salmonella. We can see here three uh, antibiotics uh, classes where uh, identified that uh, responded to the definition uh, salmonella MDR serotype pruna. And otherwise, for the resistance, it was more frequent from chicken isolate, 83%, uh, against 10.5%. Uh, and this is due uh, to uh, uh, often uh, or used of, um, I would say, uh, often use of uh, antibiotics among the population. Next slide, please. Regarding the uh, genetics now, if you look at AMR profile and resistance, so what did we observe? I would like to speak now about uh, genetic resistance regarding uh, genes. You, we observed that the resistance uh, genes, uh, we can see here the quinolone uh, resistance, uh, this mutation points, as you can see uh, here on the, the gene A and G, GRA and PARC C as mentioned. And we also see uh, a resistance to aminoglycosid uh, found with 10 a gene detected in 34 isolate. The particularity here is that uh, there is a, a good uh, a presence, for example, of the gene acetyltransferase uh, um, detected in all isolate uh, 
of salmonella without conferring resistance uh, uh, of uh, sensible uh, um, strains. Uh, so I believe that there is a gene presence, but it is not yet expressed. So we need to be very prudent or cautious as uh, we can see that the resistance could be present. This is uh, also uh, for phosphotransfer as a subfamily F3 also found in most of isolates of salmonella. Next slide, please. Beyond these two molecules that I just mentioned, we also observed that there is a strong prevalence of uh, uh, genes, uh, as you can see here on this uh, slide, 72% of isolate had, um, had the gene SOL1, SOL2 or the FRA. And often you could see the presence of these uh, genes. Additionally, we uh, saw that uh, the PUNA serotype uh, was resistant to uh, chloramphenicol, uh, as it possessed a fluor ARG. We also see a strong prevalence uh, to uh, TET A or TET B uh, resistant isolate to tetracycline. And also we observe the presence of uh, uh, genes uh, uh, such as uh, BLE oxartane and BLE TEM1 and BLE DHA uh, minus one and BLE CMY minus two. And uh, also uh, regarding uh, resistance. We also saw uh, the presence of uh, the gene FOSA A uh, found in seven isolate, even though we didn't do the uh, drug test for a phosphonist. Uh, it wasn't yet uh, tested, but it was present on seven isolate already. Next slide, please. And I just uh, mentioned genes, but I would like now to speak about plasmids. So uh, these are uh, elements and they are present in most uh, genes uh, implied in transmission or transfer or some uh, genes, uh, not only uh, resistance, uh, but I would say that these are uh, genetic elements that have the possibility to replicate from one and be transferred from one bacteria to another and such as the transfer as through transformation, transmission of uh, genetic elements. I'm going to uh, speak uh, about a new plasmid that are uh, definitely implied in uh, transfer, as we can see here. So on isolates that we uh, we saw that 55.6% of isolate were carrying plasmid. Most plasmid, uh, we see a repartition as uh, such, 42.1% uh, in humans and 60.4% in chicken from, I mean, emanating from chicken. Most of these uh, plasmids uh, were uh, uh, also uh, carried by Brancaster, 64.3%, Hadar, 81.8%, and Seftenberg, 100%, and Schwarzengrund, 75% serotypes. Regarding Kentucky ST198, it harbored also plasmid uh, in contracts to contrast to ST314. 
as I said, regarding serotyping and Tuki that we saw on genetic uh, on the genetic uh, uh, side, we had ST198, which uh, is an international clone, and also the uh, 314. So 198 was uh, found more in human, while the ST314 was more found in chicken. So it's the 198 that was carrying plasmids uh, in contrast to ST314. And most uh, plasmids uh, were also uh, uh, had genes uh, of resistance to antibiotics. And I said, we also classified them to a capacity to carry uh, this uh, resistance. For example, uh, plasmids harbored virulence genes on pathogenic, like E. coli. It were also found, and we found INCLA1 or ENCL1 harbored, uh, found on uh, EAEC and uh, Shigella, and also ENCF2, which harbored the uh, FAEEDC complex found in ETEC in E. coli um, interotoxy and otherwise for uh, the plasmic harbored PAP genes of uh, UPEC was also fine, found. So these uh, genes uh, was found in isolate of, salmonel, of salmonella, which enables the uh, bacteria E. coli, and these are aggregate forms or anthropogenic. And as I said, we also found these on our salmonella isolates. Uh, next slide, please. In conclusion, we saw that on our salmonella isolate, uh, there is a greater diversity on genetic on the genetic side, uh, and uh, with uh, we see uh, stereotypes uh, specific uh, to humans, while others are more specific to animals and that we have found in both, uh, which is uh, Kentucky and uh, Schwarzenegger, and otherwise for the Kentucky one, it is a serotype that uh, two, uh, that presents two a uh, clone, uh, 198 and ST314, uh, and uh, we can therefore say that the progenetic is really adapted or very well adapted uh, regarding resistance to anti-microbians uh, and otherwise uh, the endemicity of salmonella and serotype diversity are a major public health concern, especially in the context of the uh, rising frequency of uh, INTS and, and namely uh, in um, chickens as food and eggs, we can find salmonella, and uh, we see it also in a pork meat uh, contaminated by salmonella. Even in uh, Senegal, we uh, didn't really um, study the salmonella as, uh, I would say, in food uh, products, uh, this uh, I would say that um, when we do analysis, uh, we uh, uh, rather focus on the epidemiology of the salmonella uh, to uh, detect uh, the uh, resistance uh, profile. Most of studies do so. We uh, didn't uh, do a study of uh, different sectors to uh, see the transmission of salmonella at uh, other um, levels, and uh, I believe that it's uh, for Senegal, but also in most uh, African countries. Salmonella were uh, described or also were found on some, uh, I would say, uh, wild uh, animals and uh, isolates, and 
found in a that most between humans and chicken that there is uh, therefore a great uh, potential of contamination including to include according to our studies uh, and uh, in senegal serotypes are really diversified in the uh, context uh, regarding invasive infection uh, regarding INTS. Next slide, please. The genomic uh, approach, I would say, is according to our studies for AMR, For isolates uh, found in chicken, which is uh, uh, frequently found, it is definitely uh, linked to uh, resistance uh, of antibiotics in farming for uh, production. We should have policies and strategies in place to uh, try to tackle that. And there is a strong resistance uh, to antimicrobials used to treat clinical salmonellas, including SXT and fluorokinolones was high and was concordant and resistance to bilactam replaced the quinolone for treatment was low. This finding is consistent to available data in uh, Senegal. So these uh, uh, results uh, match the results obtained presently and beyond the resistance of uh, first choice we still have the beta lactam as uh, mentioned and it is quite low and we are lucky we it enabled us to put in place uh, a good uh, surveillance strategy regarding beta lactam at uh, country level and sub regional level i believe that a strategy should be in place a robust and integrated surveillance system is needed to tackle amr and implement uh, appropriate countermeasures I believe uh, that in Senegal and other sub-regions, uh, it they are they are definitely uh, or they are starting to elaborate plans and strategies regarding one health approach, and we need uh, to um, advance in this direction and to realize these uh, strategies uh, and put them in place. I believe that One Health is definitely therefore a good approach to identify uh, sources of contamination of AMR dissemination. And this will contribute to have a better vision on the efficacy and to uh, better adapt uh, treatments. I thank you for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, please do not uh, hesitate. And yeah, I also uh, wanted to show you two publications. This is the slide. So the first one was uh, more oriented on genomics of human and chicken salmonella isolates in Senegal. And uh, it was on uh, non uh, on potentially invasive non typhoidal salmonella infections, while the other one uh, was uh, uh, done in Senegal as well on antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Fall, for that great presentation. I think, um, you know, there was a lot of technicalities about the studies, but I think the take home message for all of us is that 
we do see and we do see this these risks for cross contamination from um, the animal health sector, especially in this case in farming practices and in feeding antibiotics to our animals and seeing these resistant strains crossing over in our food chain to the human health sector. And so I think that message was very clear and the need for a robust one health approach to AMR surveillance moving forward, where we, we prioritize as much surveillance in the human health sector as we do uh, in the animal health sector as we do in the human health sector. So Dr. Fowl, um, we have a few minutes for some questions from our audience. Um, just, a pres just a comment to say from Wati Paso that this is excellent work and yes, we will share the presentations. Um, a question from Dr. Pascal Ondoa, she asks, how are you going to sensitize the chicken farmers? Um, so what are you going to, what are the steps that from this study that Senegal is taking to ensure that those who are farming chickens are sensitized on the, on the findings of this study so that we can look at more um, controlled use of antibiotics in our farming um, sector? So please, Dr. Fowl, that first question for you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Beatrice. And uh, thank you all. Thanks all. I thank also Pascal Ondoa for the intervention and, and question. So right now in Senegal, we have working to to set up and implement uh, a strategy through a one health approach. And in our strategy, we it is coordinated by the uh, Secretariat General du Gouvernement at the top level and include uh, all the all the different ministry the ministry of health animal and and environmental and right now we are working to to implement this strategy and i think uh, after the validation of the strategy uh, i think uh, uh, a global action plan will be set up in the country in order to sensitize all the different actor like uh, uh, veterinary and also clinician to better use antibiotic and uh, and combat antibiotic resistance. And I think uh, uh, this strategy is also implemented by all the African country through the global uh, uh, global African network. Uh, that's I can say. If you have more comment or additional comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank merci, you. Doctor. Just, uh, just a little comment, uh, Dr. Uh, Fall. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, very, very enriching. Do you have example of uh, best uh, practices? For example, maybe are you going to consider when you see that uh, antibiotics are not well uh, utilized and that it can have repercussion on uh, also financially speaking, for example, um, Maybe there are things that are working in your context that you have noted. Can you speak to us about it? Senegal. Uh, I can say that at the level of Senegal, uh, we definitely observed that this and uh, actually we are working in this sense to put in place a policy uh, that we for the management and usage of uh, antibiotics for all actors, as I mentioned, veterinarians and clinicians, and also at the level of farmers and also at borders. Yes, at the borders of our country. So Senegal works uh, definitely in this reduction. It needs to be consolidated and validated with recommendations. And I believe that thereafter some actions will be undertaken, but otherwise, uh, definitely, uh, we are still at the state of observation. And even if it's not uh, finalized, we started to do some outreach campaign on the uh, logical and better usage of uh, um, antibiotics. But there isn't a strategy yet which is validated and approved. Not yet. Thank you very much for your response, Dr. Fahl. Um, let me go back to a question from Wati Paso. Um, and she asked, from this work, were you able to ascertain if resistance was from multiple or from a single clone? I don't well understand. 
please repeat your question. So the question is from um, Dr. Watipaso Kasambara. So Watipaso, please, if you're present, perhaps you can unmute and then um, further illuminate on your on your question, please. Dr. Watipaso. Okay, so the question is, and oh. I'll read again. yes, please go ahead. Oh, th thank you so much for the great presentation and great piece of work which uh, Senegal has done. I, I failed to capture that in the presentation. If uh, the resistance, because there is a number of resistance panels which were which, which were tested, and uh, a number of genes which have 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 been shown. We've seen genes in the aminoglycosides, but also in the ESBLs, but also we've seen the fluoroquinolone genes, the GRPs and PAN. So I was trying to ask that from this analysis, were you able to understand that these resistance, are they from multiple clones from the phylogenic tree? Because we were not able to see the clusters. Were you able to see that yes. is this from a multiple clone or it's from a single clone? Uh, great, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the resistance, uh, uh, the resistance uh, some of them are specific to some serotype. As you see in the phylogenetic tree, uh, it's a serotype, a uh, 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 clustered in, in single, uh, in single, uh, it's a serotype are uh, clustered together, except it to the Kentucky serotype. And when you look at uh, the phylogenetic tree uh, and associate it to resistant clone, there are no specificity to, to its serotype. We have diverse uh, diversity of resistant gene distribution in the different serotype. Thank you for that. Dr. Watibaso, any follow-up? No, I'm saying that's excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a, another question here. Let me start from the question from Kenneth Moore. He says, I think there is a need for, uh, following on from Dr. Pascal's comments, that there is a need to engage with farmers. And there is growing evidence from them that antibiotics use is related to the increased growth uh, and production. So what could be um, what could be the options to curb this? So the, I think the question is really saying that we know that you know antibiotic use has increased um, in the productivity of farming and growth. So if you're going to engage with the farmers and to let them know that these are issues, um, this this is a, a, an issue that needs of concern. What are going to be the strategies that we put in place in terms of being able to control antibiotic use, but also being able um, to allow the farmers to see the growth in their sectors as well. Because I think if, if you're going to do anything that is going to impact on their productivity and their growth on their business, it, there is going to be met with resistance. So what will be, what is the approach? Have we thought of the approach that we're going to take to ensure that we can address antimicrobial resistance without impacting too severely on um, the, the farming sector? Thank you. Great, uh, it's a, a nice comment. I think that we have to be very, very efficacious uh, to the strategy which we plan to implement in order to get the total engagement. And uh, excuse me. Great. I think, excuse me, great. I think that we, we, we need to be very efficient and efficacious on the strategy we, which, on we, which we plan to, to set up to, to engage the farmer. The most problem is the farmer because right now uh, there are no control, efficient control on the use of, of antibiotics in contrast to the high income country. In our, in our context, uh, accessibility of antibiotic is very, very free, if I can say. And I think we need to, to make a, a great strategy. And I don't know exactly because if you don't not allow farmer to get antibiotic, you have to propose an alternative, right? And I think we have to, 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 to prevent the, the possibility to make uh, 
production without using antibiotics and show them efficacy and result obtaining from, from on this approach. And, and, and if we make awareness on the dangerosity of overuse of antibiotics to the pharma and propose them alternative solution, I think they will uh, uh, able to, 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 to stop using antibiotics for food production. And uh, if uh, we show that there are an economic impact, uh, we have to, to orient, the, to, to, to orient the, the strategy on economic aspects in order to get the engagement. That's my, my point of view. Thank you, Dr. Fa. Um, let me go back to the comments. Um, there is a, a couple of comments here from, there's one from Mapu, and my apologies if I don't pronounce that properly, it says, thank you for the excellent work. I think other measures such as improved biosafety and IPC on, far, on the farms um, and bird markets will help in reducing such occurrences. Um, so do you concur that if we see some other measures such as biosecurity and IPC on farms and, and in bird markets, this might also um, help? Mm, I do not well understand uh, this question. Okay, so I, I think what, um, what we're, we're saying is that if um, biosecurity, so please, if um, the comment is that or we can, if the comment is still um, with us. You could probably elaborate on your comment, please. Go ahead. Okay, I don't get in. So let, let's move on to a, a question, I would say, from Sylvester Moyo, and that will be the last question for this session. Um, um, before that, I would like to read a comment from Leticia Boadi, um, which says, government are slow in integrated intervention for AMR contaminants. Without support from policymakers, the fight against AMR is, is difficult. And I think we, we all agree with that, that um, we need government strategies, we need government action plans. And because a lot of the time that comes with a mandate and, and when we have documents or when we have guidance and we don't have a mandate, we don't have something which is legislative and binds people to doing what they're supposed to do in, in law, it's very difficult for us to take appropriate action. So that's a very relevant comment. And we need to see that approach moving forward where we have really government led strategies and approaches which are bound in legislation to be able to help us to move forward. Um, Kenneth, you have your hand up quickly. Just um, could you go on with your comment or question? Yeah, uh, in, in line with the same, I I'm still of the view that uh, they they still need for more engagement and uh, trying to find alternative solutions to it. Uh, learning from our experiences in Malawi, I think uh, uh, the farmers might be willing to to change the, the perception and how they use uh, the antibiotics, but. The challenges now come in because you see in Africa we have issues that come in like poverty and stuff. So regardless of us having policies that can uh, stop the use of antibiotics or guide the use of antibiotics, but we may not come completely to address the situation if we don't actively engage uh, with the people that are using antibiotics. So maybe trying to go back with the feedback to the farmers and explaining with them uh, uh, what we are seeing and we're observing throughout. I think that that can be one of the solutions. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely agreed. And on that note, we would like to bring an end to this session and to say thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you for your comments and your questions. Um, and we thank you, Dr. Fowl, and to IPD for sharing this study with us and really emphasizing the need why we need to move forward really with a One Health approach to AMR surveillance. Um, we look forward to engaging with you all in our next scope session and you'll get the flyers at the appropriate time. Um, in the interim, we will share all the presentations via the, um, our mailing list. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a good day. Have a good weekend.